Good afternoon, this is Gary Kavanagh here on TRSI. I'm here today with my friend and colleague, Michael Dwarr. Michael, how have you been since Tuesday, which is this week, but you know, no one can complain about that. I think like most of the country, Gary, I've been slightly damp. But other than that, in good spirits. The king is dead, long live the king. So we will get on to some of the polling, we'll get on to the Fine Gael Ardèche, we'll get on to some of the new developments in the asylum system. But I wanted, Michael to uh, open the show with a shout out to some of our uh, brave lads in the civil service. Oh, yes. Some of you may recall me talking about putting in FOIs before the referendum to a couple of the departments to try and get information on what they were saying internally about those referendums. And I mentioned, I think, at some point that I had staggered those requests, Michael, so that some of them would come in just after the referendum finished. So that basically they couldn't say, well, we're not going to give it to you because the process is still ongoing. Yes. And that the Department of Equality, in a staggering display of efficiency, had decided that they were going to respond to my request ahead of the deadline so they could turn it down for being before the referendum yeah. rather than waiting until after it and responding. Classic. And so I, I went back to them and I appealed it. And I also said, I also want to complain because, you know. It's clearly done so that you can refuse it. And I got the response back there, Michael. Yeah. And the response, and I've I've got to appreciate this, is that the FOI Act provides outer time frames for responding to FOI requests rather than setting a minimum time frame, and therefore your complaint has no basis. Well, that seems reasonable. Well, I mean, who am I to doubt the words of the Department of Equality? But I do feel that I'm having a slightly different conversation than they're having. And they probably understand what I'm saying, but are being very clear that that's not the conversation they're going to have. Yeah, well, sometimes, Gary, it's a conversation that you want to have and there's a conversation they want to have and they're just not going to have that conversation. They know the conversation they want to have and that's the conversation they're having. Yes, important to note, FOI requests, not a minimum time frame. You got no jokes about that? No, I have no jokes about that at all. No witty comments? None. Zero. You're letting the side down, Michael. Uh, I don't think it's me that's letting the side down here, Gary. I might edit in more silence there again, and then people will have to wonder if their phones are broken because you had nothing to come in on. I think what's happening here, Gary, is you can't deal with the fact that you you put in a sloppy and uh, unjustifiable uh, FOI, and now you're getting knocked back by the good people at Equality. And you're getting all peevy about it. I mean, Michael, I've got to admit that um, I was slightly taken aback. When you sort of go, oh, by the way, you clearly did this to deliberately say no to an FOI rather than having to deal with it. And some might say that, you know, the point of an FOI department is to promote transparency as opposed to, you know, deliberately trying to take someone out at the knee because you can. You don't really expect to be the and. That doesn't sound like our problem. That sounds like your problem. Yeah, that's very much a very much a you problem, not so much a me problem. Anyway, the point of an F of a of, of an FOI department, Gary, is to have an FOI department. So that if you're ever asked, you say yes, we have one. It's not transparency. Yeah, but Michael, they're not thinking of other people. If they don't give me these FOIs, and then I don't allow them to be given to other people, how are the Irish Times to write stories based on my work without crediting me? The entire ecosystem could collapse. Well, there is always the chance the Irish Time might just do its own FOI. And let's face it, if you send me in an FOI right, from the Irish Times, I'm far more likely to look at that and to respond in a positive fashion because I know the Irish Times will deal with the information in a responsible fashion. You have to think about that, Kerry. You're going around being irresponsible. Are we including situations in which the Irish Times are given FOI data, see the FOI reference number, and just ask the department to give them all of that information, specifically so that they can say that they got it themselves rather than relying on other people's FOIs? Are we including that as the Irish Times putting in FOI requests? Well, yeah. Because if, if we are, then yeah, absolutely, they're perfectly capable of doing that. Yeah, I, th- I think we are. And you know what? <laughs> Why not? I mean, the number was there. The, it, it saved everybody a lot of time. And it saved everybody the trauma of having to say that uh, they got it from Gript, which I imagine some people in the Irish Times would would prefer not to run the story at all, rather than to say that. I've, I have seen over the past week four stories uh, in mainstream media, in the Irish Times and the Irish Independent, uh, notably, uh, that I'm pretty sure are based on material that Grip put together. Uh, and in zero of those cases have we ever seen you know, a credit for it. But Michael, we are moving forward. When we started, they just ignored everything we did, particularly during COVID. 
Whereas now they're just taking the work, which is actually a massive step upwards. And you lads over at Crypt, you love being the talk about the mainstream media. I, I'm curious what constitutes the mainstream media. Is it is it size? Is it dimension? Is it historical legacy? You know, you've been here for 50 years. Because with the way your numbers are going, Gary, there's a very decent chance that not that far distant future, you'll be mainstream media. It's like... You remember when the Supreme Court in America was considering the point of pornography? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, they were yeah, asked yeah. to define it, and they're like, well, you know it when you see yes. it. I don't know what it, I can't give you a definition, but I know it when I see it. I think if you just line up the grift journalists and some of the mainstream journalists, you might not be able to say why, but you will know that these are different people. Actually, it reminds me of um, during some one of the scandals we had last year, one like particular bad news cycle for grift. Yeah. I got a, a text from someone <laughs> just said... Keep the chin up. And remember, however much you hate journalists, it's not enough. <laughs> and I just, res- I just responded going, but I am a journalist. And the response I got back was, yeah, but not like those other fucks. <laughs> it's, yeah, all, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all, all. There are journalists and then there are journalists. Well, yeah. Or maybe there's you're going to fall down into a hole full of no true Scotsman. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go too far down that hole. But anyway, that's good to know that we you now have anyway strict a better understanding of the parameters around as what it is you need to do for a successful FOI. So going forward, you can keep that in mind. Yeah, I've really and you know before it was like what can I find that's useful, and now it's going to be what is it that I can find to keep other journalists in work. Um, I might start redacting the FOI reference numbers when I pass them over to people just for my own amusement. I would say the government is doing more to keep journalists in work than you are. I mean, yeah. On the um, to touch on the the Ardesh that uh, Fine Gael had, not to toot our own horn, Michael, but listeners of the show will be aware that we were saying Phil Hogan coming back, bit of a retro feel to yeah. it. Talking to Harris, advising people back in the mix, which was interesting then to see all of the reporting from Ardesh which I'll make sure to kind of mention in a throwaway fashion. By the way, Phil Hogan is here. Yes, Phil was there. Now, I imagine that Phil wouldn't have a problem getting a ticket to the Ardesh anyway. Um, I would be still... If we were involved in those conversations that are happening deep in the sanctuary behind the tabernacle of Fine Gael, I would we see Phil at the high table at the right hand of Simon, whispering in his ear? Or would he be in the antechamber? writing notes and slipping them under the door. Phil is a man with a a fairly decent sense of his own value and he has created within Fine Gael and not just within Fine Gael a sense that he is a brilliant political animal and strategist. I am sceptical to agree that that could be stood up in a court of law. You're being deeply unfair. Am I? It's not like me. Yeah, because you've looked at his results. Well, yeah. And that's, you know, that's deeply unfair for a politician. It's like Ivana Patrick. You just believe she can win an election. And you ignore the fact that behind her is the flaming wreckage of nearly every time she's tried to run. No, no, you don't. In the same way no. with, with Phil Hogan, you say that Phil Hogan is a master of certain political things. And you don't highlight some of the things he's tried to do, like some... Should we say things with um, councils, Michael? No, they're, they're very... They're or, fun- you know, local governments. Yeah, and- yeah there's a fund... When I'm talking more politically, it's brilliant political strategies. Like uh, when he said that Fine Gael were going to win the 2002 general election by talking about Sinn Féin. And they were going to tie Sinn Féin to Fianna Fáil. This was the great strategy, which the Fine Gaelers loved, but everybody else went, you're going to what now? Anyway, there is a fundamental difference between him and, I mean, Fine Gael and, and Batchett. Ivana... The reason you put in Ivana in those positions is not because you think Ivana is going to win elections. It's because Ivana is lovely. And if only people knew her better, then she would be elected by acclamation. The problem is people just don't know her well enough. No, listen, Ivana Batrick is the triumph of hope over experience. Like a second marriage. <laughs> second? Well, whatever. I mean, we're we're down, like, we're at Vegas Chapel level of marriage there. Elvis is coming into the building. So, yes, Phil Hogan was at it. Um, we had the wild speculation to what extent. I'll tell you, now, somebody said to me uh, uh, from the world of the blue, you know, this um, Harris notion, uh, we had a disagreement about it. And, you know, in politics, that's possible. We're not talking about Euclid's axioms. About, you know, this thing about who, if you're going to be a cabinet minister, you had to stay... Uh, if you had you had to run, guarantee that you're going to run. And I think it's a bad idea. This other person is a very good idea. But 
Somebody said, oh, that's a Phil Hogan idea. That's a Phil Hogan idea. The funny thing was they were saying it because they thought this was a really good idea. Really clever, solid, starting off. Oh, that's a brilliant, brilliant idea. And I thought to myself, yeah, yeah, that is a Phil Hogan idea. Because I can think, I think it's a dreadful idea. But there you go. The way two different people can see two, the same thing from different angles, Gary, isn't it wonderful? It's what diversity is all about. You keep talking like this, you're going to be going in Phil Hogan's book. <laughs> no, no, Phil. I'm not important enough. Five years from now, you'll, you'll like slip on a piece of pavement. And as you fall, you'll just see the shadow move away from you. <laughs> I'm nowhere near important enough for Phil to have me in his book. You say that, but Phil Hogan is absolutely a man who recognises that ambition can just as easily crawl as it can soar. <laughs> anyway, the other things happened at the Ardesh other than Phil Hogan. Kate O'Connell, for instance, in <laughs> she said uh, something which I heard and thought there are going to be a lot of people very happy to hear that. Yeah where she said that with Leo Varadkar going, it was the end of a very dark period in her life. Not the part where the dark period was over, but that the dark period had happened. <laughs> well, yeah, indeed. But also, there was something rather beautiful about the way that she made, she managed to make Leo's period as Taoiseach and then his resignation all about her. <laughs> it was basically, when people, historians, look back on this, this would be considered, it would be called Kate's dark time. It would, I mean, the fact she was able to do that did immediately give me this feeling of kind of nostalgia for when she was a TD. Because it's like, ah, yes, it's about Kate. It's all about Kate. Everything yeah. is about Kate. You might think it's not about Kate, but that's just because you don't understand the level at which this impacts on Kate. I was going to make a joke about her constituency work, but that seemed unfair considering she's no longer in politics. When she runs, we can start making those jokes yes. again. And because she may be on the way back. A lot, a lot of, a lot of talk, a lot of talk that they may, she may be added to the Euro slate in Dublin. I do, I do like the idea of her and James Gagan, who will be the other person, being called into a room and just being told, well, what's going to happen is you're going to fight to the death and whichever one of you wins will be a TD. Congratulations. Apparent, no, I don't know, this This seems unlikely to me, but apparently there is polling out there which says that Josefa Madigan is not setting the world on fire. And if that's true, I, you know, you think, what kind of world is it? I mean, Josefa Madigan would struggle to set her locality on fire if she's self-immolated. Anyway, because of that, there's a... Um, I'm not in a position to make it... If, if, the, if this is an addition that would work, you know what? Maybe it would. Maybe uh, maybe Kate O'Connell would ignite or excite some of those Dublin Bay South, Dunleary, you know, Rathgar, Rathfarnham voters. I don't know. Um, you mean those voters that everyone has been desperately, desperately trying to get for vote for them, but amongst Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael and who they have nearly always failed to get because they think a lot of those parties are scum? That, yeah, that kind of voter. Those people? Yeah. Yeah. But maybe the Social Democrats would look at her. I, I don't know. It's I don't know. I, I am not in a position. I, I, I can't see the charms of the individual. So therefore, I'm not in a position to know how other people would perceive her. But she may. She might. She might be a, a, an absolute trump card for them. What does what is Harris saying? His vision will be. It's a bit retro, Michael. Uh -huh. No harm in that, though. Uh, lower taxes. Brutalised criminals, rule like a king, <laughs> I think would be the... Yes, rule. The summary that would of be that. It sounds like a good, that sounds like a good, a good place to I mean, to I can fully support that. The, the issue is, can they actually do it? And I do really like this whole, we're going to lower USC. A couple of years ago, you campaigned to get rid of USC. No, they didn't. And when you brought USC in, yeah, they said that, but they lied, Michael. Oh, Oh, he used the L word. I don't like that. I feel very uncomfortable. Yeah. Do you remember when Pascal came out and said, oh, I've, I've never campaigned uh, against USC and I just pulled all, every instance in which he had mm -hmm. and uh, everyone just ignored that that had happened? Actually, we were the only, if I remember correctly, we were the only news outlet which said he had previously campaigned for. Other people said things like, it caused some confusion, but didn't say why, as opposed to he had clearly campaigned for it and was now saying he hadn't. Because that was in the past. 
I think one 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 out there did say something. Not that he personally, but that Fine Gael had. Uh, yes, that was it. I think that was the Irish Times approach that, and not that um, you know Pascal had published election literature specifically saying he would get rid of it. But they were right in that it only happened for a brief period, and before he was saying it was impossible, and after he was saying it was impossible. But for that very brief period, which coincidentally, Michael coincided with the election period he was very strong <laughs> on the fact it would be gotten rid of it was uh, it, it was something of a coincidence all right yes anyway so he's going to crack down on crime brutalize criminals robber of like king he's going to build two hundred and fifty thousand houses over the next five years personally the government is he's going to go out with which will keep him busy. Now, the thing about that, Gary, is, the thing about that is, when you say that quickly, that sounds like an awful lot of houses, does it not? When you divide 250,000 by five, you get 50,000. Which sounds like it's below the other numbers we were told we'd need to actually hit. Well, since at the moment the target, which we're, I don't, are we actually hitting yet, or or just about, is 33,000. And the report to the department said that actually we needed to build around 58,000. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so building 50,000 will still mean when, by the time we get there, and we won't, by the way, this guy, they will not build 50,000. No. I, I mean, not, not today or tomorrow. It may happen. I, Gary, we will eventually reach a point where the, the industry will be in a position to build as many houses as is required by the market, at which point we should put the timer on to see how quickly we can generate an oversupply and a collapse in the housing market, which leading to a banking crisis and the country being fucked all over again. So, you know, there's lot, there, there are lots of other good things to come from this. Don't worry. I mean, we, we, haven't, we haven't got close to the real catastrophe yet. We're just building up to it or not building up to it. But even 50,000 houses isn't going to be enough to meet the requirements. Well, in his in his favour, Michael, the immigration shit show has taken a lot of pressure off on housing. Now, explain that to me in words of one syllable. How would this is what? Well, because immigration has somehow, I mean somehow, become the number one issue with voters, they've become less concerned about housing relative to immigration. Uh, just thrown out at, at here, Gary, do you not think that perhaps the reason that the immigration has become the number one concern is fairly tightly connected to the to the housing crisis and if we didn't have a housing crisis the number of people would be that terribly concerned about the migration thing would be would be reduced because you wouldn't be you wouldn't be taking you wouldn't be paying 53 million a year to the to city west for accommodation for example no i strongly believe the public has no object permanence like little babies yeah, so you see, they look at housing, and then when they look at immigration, no one thinks, are these things linked? Uh-huh. And that, that, I assume, is the basis on which most political party advisors work as well. Voters have no object permanence. Well, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting theory, Gary. I think, you know, somebody out there might, might do a master's or a doctorate on that one. He did also say, you know, lower taxes, that no one earning under 50,000 should pay the higher rate of tax. A policy I entirely approve of mm-hmm. because I don't like to pay tax and I pay just so much tax. A sickening amount of tax. I, I, could, I, 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 could, I should tell the, the listener at this stage that for the last little while, I don't know why particularly this has become a thing, but Gary spends 25 to 55% of his time talking to me, complaining about the amount of tax he has to pay, the amount of tax he has paid and the amount of tax he's going to pay. It has become something of a bugbear with him, and frankly, I'm getting kind of tired of it. So, I mean, if the if someone's going to come along and cut the taxes, just from my own personal life, I'd be very happy. Gary, not happy about paying taxes. I just, I pay so much tax. <laughs> you, you know what? I think I think your man. What what's your man that runs Ryanair called? Michael O'Leary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think he pays more. I, I mean, I legitimately, Michael, do not understand why above a certain pay level you would be tax resident in Ireland. And not just the personal taxes. On the business side of things, when we're looking at, like, 
let's say Grift wants to do some production work for something yeah. as, as an additional revenue stream. When you actually start looking into, like, you know, you have this this headline figure which looks really good, and then you're like, okay, but then there's VAT on that, and then you have your costs, and some of those are going to be VAT allowable, and some aren't. And then you have to pay it to people. And when you're actually looking at what do the people we're getting to do this actually get into their pocket afterwards? Like if you're on the if you're on the higher rate of tax, you're probably taking somewhere in the region of fifty percent, over fifty percent, maybe up to fifty one or so, fifty one point five, I think. And then you also have VAT. I feel like you've only recently discovered the existence of VAT because for a while. We had a lot, you know, I, we got a, a, quite a bit about PRSI and about USC and about marginal rates. But l- lately, VAT has started to really bother you, particularly. I thought, which is strange, because I think, you know, VAT is it's not like a new thing. But suddenly, VAT is a very big problem for Gary. Grip does very little work where we could claim VAT back. So any VAT we pay is effectively just a hit to our bottom line. And what was the, you said to me, when, you, you, 23%. And the government did nothing to earn that, which I kind of, I'm sympathetic. Yeah, so you just, it, but it massively increases the price of everything. And then on the side of things where people are paying such a high level of tax, you have to pay them more because they're receiving such a limited percentage of it. So our wage bill is substantially higher. And it just, if there was less tax, you know, we would charge less for things so other people could get them more easily and our people would make more money. So, and then they might go out, Michael, and buy things. Because goods and services can be, can, be, can be purchased with money. In that way, from the horse droppings through the sparrow, everyone is richer. Okay. Horse and sparrow. Classic. Up, th- up there with broken windows and bastiat. So, it, to be fair, the Ardesh was pretty much exactly what we expected it to be. It was, you know, a call back to the glorious past. You don't really see that a lot in Ireland because of, you know, England. I thought not not always to be so, the same sort, but for me this well not there was nothing interesting about it. It was what it was, but some of the some of the uh, shall we say the commentary or the journalism about it I felt was almost odd. It's like I, I was going to say it was like the journalists were writing with hangovers, but I would have thought that in back in the day anyway, most of the best journalism was produced with, by men and women. With, with pretty bad hangovers. There was um, one headline, not uh, journalists don't write their headlines, but admittedly, admittedly, but what was it? It's Harris on Fire? Harris on Fire, Rockstar Harris. Yeah, this kind of stuff. I thought, really? really? Were we watching the same show? Were we at the same movie? It, you have to say, though, it was decent timing. I mean, I don't know if Leo was thinking about this when he, he, he launched the surprise on the nation. But once it became clear that neither Coveney nor Pascal wanted the job and that Simon had been working hard to make sure that when it came to it, he kind of really already had the job, so there was not going to be any other competition, that for the point of view of the party and for Simon, having the Ardesh so close to his uh coronation as leader of the party actually worked very well for for media minutes and for exposure so i thought but yet gary strangely if we're not going to talk about that now we have well of course the it would have happened before the ardesh but the poll the poll doesn't show a simon bounce yet the poll that was carried out was uh, an ireland thinks poll for the irish independent contained one of my favourite results from a poll in a long time, Michael. Yeah. Because it just encapsulated a lot about polling for me and um, how people use polling. <laughs> and it was this. 14% of the public believe junior minister Patrick O'Donoghan, O'Donovan should get a senior ministry. Yes. Michael, here's a question for you. He's a junior minister. What's he a junior minister of? Yeah. Um, you see, now, if I had been sensible... Before this, when I was going through those names, I would have Googled those various names and made sure. You see, some of them are already I said. For example, Jennifer Carl McNeil, we are told in the article, is Minister of State in the Department of Finance. 
Alan Dillon is mentioned, Peter Burke is mentioned, and uh, Junior Minister Patrick O'Donovan is mentioned. I, I am sceptical, but what I'm saying is I am in deeply sceptical, Gary, that any that 14% of the population of the Republic of Ireland could pick Patrick O'Donovan out of a lineup. And I'm I'm sceptical that 14% of the members of Patrick O'Donovan's family could pick him out of a lineup. Now, there are some names that, yes, uh, Neil uh, Richmond is there. I think that Neil has a certain profile. Hildegard Nocton has a certain profile, if nothing else, because that is the best name in Irish politics. Hildegard Nocton. Now, you could say she sounds a bit more like maybe a medieval mystic or a saint or an abbess or something, but I think Hildegard Nocton's a fantastic name. 18% of the public's preferred cabinet. But the rest of them, I don't believe for a minute that people know who the hell they were talking I think they were... I, I didn't look at I didn't look at the uh, the actual thing itself, but I'm I'm guessing that there there was a list and people were asked to tick a box or list one two three or some kind of preference order, because I do not believe that thirteen percent of the people know that European Affairs Minister of State is Peter Burke or what Peter Burke looks like sounds like or has done in his life, I or where he's from. The people who voted for him in his constituency might know, but after that, no, I, 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 I would suspect you're right. It's entirely possible that it was an open-ended question, and fourteen percent of people said, when asked, "Well, of course, Patrick O'Donnell." Of course, I feel it was probably a list. I, I hope. Every time I see a question like this, I always hope that the next question is, "And of the people you've selected, who are they?" <laughs> Of the person selected, which Just, of these five photographs identify the person you've selected? <laughs> yeah. Just to be a prick. Yeah, I mean, it's important that you, 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 know, you fuck with the public. A little bit. A, a certain amount. But, as you said, it was the poll was carried out, I think, on Friday. So after Harris had basically been ordained uh, by the Fine Gael party, but before the Ardfesh. But Fine Gael down 1 to 21. Fine Fáil down 1 to 16. It's not good, is it? Sinn Féin down 1 to 26. Social Democrats 6. Ain't 2, 4. No movement on any of these. Green Party 4. Labour 3 minus 1. Solidarity People for Profit 2, 0. And Independent another 17 plus 3. Plus 3. So anyway, that means that's the, that that's two polls in a row that have the independents on 17. And two polls in... Yeah, two polls in a row that have Fianna Fáil on 16. What a wonderful um, credit to Michal Martin's leadership. Mm -hmm. Yes, only slightly less popular than the other category. Only slightly less popular than Fianna Fáil were in 2011, when they had basically brought the country to a point of collapse and the IMF were stalking the halls of government buildings or had been stopping the halls of government buildings in order to bail us out. And we are, and Fianna Fáil is now less polling, less popular than that, when Fianna Fáil got 17.4% of the vote and came home with 20 seats. Now, admittedly, they were not transfer friendly. <laughs> we'll see how that works this time. Uh, it must be kind of galling to solidarity people for profit. Like, you've got a couple of TDs, and yet... Ain two are on double your level. You know, you have to say Ain two with only one two D. In fairness, Ain two for no change. Considering not that long ago, Ain two weren't figuring in any of the polls at all. If one reason was sometimes they weren't included in the polling. Now, when they're being included in the polling, they've they've gone from one where they were going one zero one zero one zero, and then they hit two two two. Four, Gary, up with the Green Party, you know, they keep uh, another couple of points. I mean, they're going to, now on 4%, you would imagine they would take, I mean, unless they're dreadfully unlucky in how the vote is spread, you'd imagine Padder will take his, his own seat. But if they can stick on four and maybe even get up to five, then you're talking about, they're talking a couple of seats there. 
You're talking presence and councillors as well. I mean, if they're on four percent, they should. They certainly should be taking county councillors. Hmm. Mm. And they might take one of the European seats as well. Well, I mean, that'll be a bit of a yeah, like, that's a bit of a bait and switch there. But a little, little bit. It still yeah, counts. I'm not sure, if it's a great idea. You still have it. Um, I think they're the only thing concerned there is are they last time they didn't run enough candidates. I mean, at four percent, you can get away with running, you know, not running certain candidates and still hit two. But I think this time they'll run everywhere. They won't, won't want a replication of the, like, what was it, one point nine? Yeah. Oh, it was something heartbreak. The whole day, the whole day they've been trending at two percent or over. And it was only right at the end that they fell below the threshold. Yeah. For those who don't realise why that's important, in Ireland, uh, general party funding is made available once you receive 2% of first preference votes. And then you receive basically a pot and you receive a percentage of it based on how many first preference votes you get. But anything under 2%, you get nothing. So when Aintu came in at 1.9, I think it was, I think it was 1.9 something, like it was razor thin mm. close to it. Uh, they basically got nothing. Whereas had they gotten a fraction of a percent, they would have received hundreds of thousands of euro in party funding. And that sort of funding is incredibly useful. Now, Michael, obviously that funding shouldn't exist and none of the parties should be funded centrally. Um, and, but and, it's there and you may as well take advantage of and it. And people should be allowed to donate to political parties if they want to. And perhaps they might even get a tax benefit for doing that. Well, they might get... I'm not sure if... That's an argument for another day, but at the moment, as it stands, everything is geared towards preventing entry to the market. Everything is geared towards not having to deal with the public. But um, yeah, the the history of that was that was brought in when you were seeing a lot of European countries come under pressure from kind of insurgent political parties. Some on the right, a lot of them on the right, some on the left. And basically that law comes in or the, the funding changes come in at a time when... It was um, a cynical person, Michael, would have said it was designed to ensure that that didn't happen in Ireland and it was going to be very difficult to start up new political parties because none of the parties were reliant on funders anymore. So you couldn't draw any of them away. They were just going to be paid for by the state. And it meant that the political parties either could, although I would say more likely just simply did become disconnected from their grassroots because first of all the grassroots were diminishing anyway because you know, widespread voluntary activity is becoming less popular in certain kinds of areas and the other thing was um, they didn't have to deal with them because they didn't need people to pay membership fees they didn't need people to do church gate collections they didn't need people to buy 50 pound national lottery tickets for the party's draw and so on and so forth, because they were getting funded for by from general taxation. I think that has been well. <laughs> a regular listeners to this podcast know, Gary. They, it is, in my opinion, one of the worst things that has happened to Irish politics has been this disconnection because of the break off of the necessity of dealing with common and branches, etc. Because you have to have them because you need their you need their voluntary activity because you can't pay people because you don't have money, but you also need their money. Now you have money. Do you do you remember how this was sold? Uh, how this was kind of but when they were talking about it, how they sold it to the public. Go on. It was about removing money from politics. Yeah. Get the Galway tent out of politics. Yeah. And everyone will just be done by the state and it'll all be lovely and there'll be no there'll be no influences from outside and Effectively, all we did was turn political parties into NGOs. Exactly. Shit NGOs. Although, there's an element of redundancy there. No, actually, a lot of the NGOs are quite good. The ones who don't lobby. The little ones. And whose names... The kind of ones who are you don't know their name because they just do their thing quietly. What Burke would have called the small battalions. Yes, yes, they're fine. Not like the National Women's Council of Ireland. Yeah. God forbid... God forbid that you could go a week without mentioning and getting a dig in at the ladies. I actually, I I did something for you during the week and you have not said thank you at all. I'm racking my brains for something that Gary did for me during the week. 
you talk endlessly about alcohol lobbying and alcohol prices. I do not talk endlessly. I occasionally refer to certain items of legislation. Go on. And then I write an entire piece on Alcohol Action Ireland and the amount of money they receive and all their lobbying for you, Michael. Do I hear from you? No, <laughs> I don't. I don't even get a text saying that was interesting. Yeah. I get nothing. Yeah, uh, uh, you got. Did you even read it? I tell you what, you you got what I got from you, Gary. Was this were the same numbers of how would I say uh, credits or recognitions or acknowledgements for points that were made throughout the article that you'd already heard me make. You're just pissy because of that show I edited where it made you just talk about how nice cows were. <laughs> You made me sound demented. Genuinely. It was your fault for saying things that could be turned into those sentences. Anything can be turned into those sentences if somebody is sufficiently low and malicious and has 15 minutes of boredom to deal with because they can't be bothered looking into the abyss. It's not my fault that you think cows have nice eyes and eyelashes. I, I... you're going to do you see I, I can't engage with you because I know that if whatever I say you will do it again and I will sound demented again <laughs> and that's what I sounded yes. I sounded genuinely demented because you took out the context and I think the people should know this that in those references I, that I made to the bovines there were other connecting sentences and there was actually a discourse a dialogue a conversation it was not just me wandering around like some elderly person looking out the, the window of a car going cow oh cow and that's what i end up sounded like and he did that deliberately because he that's that's who that's who he is that's that's not what you ended up sounding like what you ended up sounding like was cows are nice i like cows cows have nice eyes cows have nice eyelashes i like cows at least i didn't get into breed specific stuff like frisians versus herefords because that would have probably i wish you had yeah. anyway on the uh on the asylum changes. Oh, yeah. Good stuff, Happy. So, we have Roderick O'Gorman coming out. What is this deal, Michael? Like, we're we're setting up a standalone entity to deal with asylum seekers? Well, the thing... I mean, the HSE, but for asylum seekers? <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, it's HSE for asylum seekers, which now makes me feel even worse for the asylum seekers than I have. You know how bad something is going, where the government goes... We need a standalone entity to handle this so that it's not our fault. Like the health service is not uh, our fault, it's the HSC. Now, you see, I think, I think, dear listeners, Gary has placed his digit precisely on the point of this exercise. Insofar as the HSC owes his existence, for a desire for for the minister to be able to stand up in the dawn and say, well, actually, that's nothing to do with me. You have to talk to the chief executive of the HSC about that now. Uh, or when the Bank of England was made independent, you know, it was all sort of very high flow reasons. But the principal reason was, you know, Min- Chancellor, are you going to change interest? Oh, well, it's nothing to do with me. That's the Bank of England, and they're independent. We have fetishized, Gary, fetishized independence. But the whole thing, you know, I, I'm not willing to say a priori before the thing is given shape and form. That the idea is a bad idea. I don't know. There are elements of it which I find curious. I mean, and this may be the language of the reporting, for example, that the government is committed to build out a core accommodation offering of 14,000 beds in state owned facilities by 2028. Now that's 14,000 beds in state owned facilities. By 2028, so that effectively, 24, 25, 26, 27, 8, that's four years, roughly, right? That's a bit of a challenge. There was an interesting point on this when Radar O'Gorman announced recently, Ben Scallon was there, and he was saying that we can expect up to 16,000 asylum seekers. Yes. And Ben Scallon went, do you mean, like, in total over your, over, like, a set period, or every year? And Roderick did the sort of well, obviously, I mean every year. But when you think about it, that's about four times the previous estimate. It is exactly four times the so previous estimate. It wasn't perhaps, you know, quite as clear as, well, obviously, it's going to be every year. Because, you know, it sounds great, Michael. We're going to build 14,000 state-owned uh, accommodation places. And then you think, 
Yeah, we're expecting 16,000 people to apply a year. So that would mean that in, in one year we would be minus 2,000. Yeah, and that's ignoring all of the people who are there already in the system. Yeah. Now, there's a number that I, I, I think worth bearing out. It was in Grip, it's also in the Irish Times. So I think, you know, Grip and the Irish Times, it must be true. The spending last year was two point, what, 1.49 billion on accommodation uh, from those fleeing the war in Ukraine and a further 640 million on accommodation for inter- international protection applicants. So that's 2.1 billion in one year, Gary. One year. Now, Sorry, just before. A number so large that you added an additional 100 million to it and it was entirely meaningless. Yeah. And then we go on, the next number is ministers were told that 5 billion would be spent accommodating asylum seekers in the state owned properties in the coming decades. I think they're talking about 20 years, right? Now, if we spent 1.5, so 2.1 billion last year, right? But we're only going to, sp- only going to spend 5 billion in the next 20 years. I'm not confident about that, Gary. Do you remember when the the children's hospital was going to cost six hundred million? I do. You know, I do. I, I I I wouldn't be I wouldn't be wildly confident about these figures staying on target, because you never know. The Russians might invade more places. For all we know, we might invade more places and create our own set of refugees. But sorry, the quest the thing about it was, sorry, I don't know if the idea is a good idea or a bad idea. My suspicion that a more efficient way of doing things is get the state to provide a service and then that can make it cheap and easy and plentiful. I'm skeptical about that. But in the context that we're in, politically, in this particular moment, is this a good, is this, is this a great idea as the kid make it? nieces and nephews used to say Uncle Michael that's a great idea when this, the idea was go to the cinema and buy sweets I don't know if this is a go to the cinema and buy sweets good idea for the voter do you? An interesting actually an interesting point about the the spend of this Michael that we saw last year nearly equaled the entire gross uh, budget of the guards yeah the guards have a budget of something like 2.4, 2.35 or 2.4 billion. And we spent 2.1 on this. If this gets any worse, we could be spending more on dealing with asylum seekers than police. And where you were talking about the, the politics of this, Michael, and how it looks, one of the things I've noticed when we've been sending gripped uh, camera people around to talk to people over the past year is... And this only happened, I'd say, within the last year. People spontaneously, with no coaching or no prompting from us, began bringing up immigrants into topics where you wouldn't expect them. Yeah. So they would be talking about how their mother can't get, um, you know, appropriate health care. And they would start bringing up, you know, and then we're paying for Ukrainian pets to be brought over or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it... It's kept happening since then. Now, often, sometimes they get into the interviews and sometimes they don't because sometimes the interviews are just on entirely different subjects and just doesn't make sense to have them in. But there seems to be a real growing sense amongst the public, I would say, of something nearing resentment that money is not the money is not going into areas which would be public facing and is instead going into this area. And I don't think, I I think the government's line of we have obligations and we have to do this is wearing very thin. And these are not people you would have thought would be concerned about this issue. But I think the cost of it has now become so high and so many people have become aware of it that any time something doesn't work the way it should, there's a question of, well, why aren't we spending that money on this? And I don't know how the government gets out of that and where before we, you were saying about housing and immigration, and I was joking, there's no object permanence. I think part of the government's problem is that there is actually object permanence and people are able to look at numbers and go, well, why is that there instead of there? Why, you know, can a child with scoliosis just not get treated when we're spending over two billion on this? I suppose one of the real problems that any government has in a situation like this 
where you you have a response. Well, in the case the, the, the Ukrainian case is a case of a of an of an unpredicted or unpredictable emergency occurring. The asylum seekers crisis that's a whole different subject. That's been a chronic and unresolved problem for quite some time now. We're talking decades more than we're talking uh, months. One of your problems is that you have to you find funds to deal with this previously unforeseen problem. And as we say here, I mean, we're talking last year, one and a half billion was spent housing Ukrainian refugees. As this goes on, we're now heading into the third year of the conflict and people become kind of used to it and habituated by it. And it's frankly, Ukraine has fallen out of the news. It's not quite, it's not in the news cycle the way it used to be. So people have slightly forgotten about why this is happening in the first place. All what they know is what's happening in front of them. And they all, they will eventually return to the problem. Well, we've been asking for X or Y. We've been asking for, oh, psych evaluation for my child in primary school. For how long? We've been looking for treatment for scoliosis. We've been looking for special treatment for spina bifida for X for how long? And we were told we're doing our best, but you know, resources are limited. And then they say, then they see 1.5 billion being spent. And they say, well, how did you get that money to do that when you didn't have this, the money to do this? How do you have money to house those people, but you didn't have money to house these people? Now, I, I understand the problem the government has because this, there, one is a, one is a, shall we say, an acute problem, one is a, a chronic problem. But it does produce eventually within voters an incipient form of resentment because if they feel like they're being told, well, there wasn't for us, but there is for them. No, I think that's, um, well, shall we say, at, 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 at some level it's kind of, it's naive and at some level it's wrong. And maybe sometimes at some level it's also right. It's a mixed bag, but it's a problem for the government. Once people start to think like that, I think you you have a couple there's a couple of reasons for that. I think one of the major problems that the government has is that when people feel a sense of resentment about that and a questioning of why you couldn't do this for this other topic, often the response to that is going to be some combination of we are inept, we were told it was impossible, and it's a chronic issue and therefore not politically pressing upon yeah. us. As opposed to there were legitimate structural issues why we couldn't do this and it's one of the interesting things about government and this government particularly there's an assumption amongst people that once people get to a certain level they have to be qualified at what they're doing they have to be good at it and therefore anything they do to you or that they do to the country if it's a bad thing is malevolent yes yeah, deliberate but oftentimes and that is not the case People at incredibly high levels of politics are actually often shockingly incompetent. But then you put an issue in front of them which becomes incredibly pressing and where they're getting international attention and civil servants start coming under pressure and their advice starts to change and suddenly stuff happens and you think, oh, well, they care more about these people than they care about this group. And oftentimes it's more that they're just not very good at their jobs. But it turns out, Michael, not being very good at your job can give an impression of you that is harmful. Well, yeah, it, we, we return again to the, the piece of sage advice given by our our friend and founder of the Edmund Burke Institute, Richard Miller, who used to say, never ascribe to malevolence or malign intent what you can otherwise ascribe to stupidity and incompetence. He was very much, he was a man, he self-described, he believed in what he called the fuck-up theory of history. And it's, we've seen it happen, kind of blow up in the government's face in multiple issues recently. But there's a ton of stuff where you look at it and you look at how much it would cost to fix. And you think, well, if a Hearn or Hahi had been dealing with that, they would have just told the civil servants to do it. And it would just be, fine money, do something with it. Just get it done. Get it fixed. Because this is a potential issue for us. And it just needs to not be there. Like the spinal bifida stuff seems like, you know, the sort of thing you could fix relatively easily. In not all cases, some of the cases are, are very bad and they can't travel and things like that. 
But you think a lot of it, you could actually get done. And I think if a Hearn or someone like that had been handling it, you would have ended up with surgeons being flown into the country and, you know, special rooms being set up to deal with it, things like that. And maybe even photographs of Bertie with small children being healed. Yeah, and, uh, you know, just a sort of, uh, I'm not going to be crass enough to say it, but remember, if it wasn't for me, your children would have not had a good time with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, we will be back uh, next week, I believe. Yep. Have a good week until then. All the best.